Hello, statistics students. We're now starting um, chapter four in our current textbook on discrete probability distributions. In this lesson, we're gonna learn a little bit about um, probability distributions in general, and then in the next video, we'll start uh, specifically on the discrete ones. So let's get going. I'll share my screen with you here. And you can see, as we always do, we have to start with some vocabulary. So we're going to introduce the random variable x. And x is a number that's associated with each outcome of a probability experiment. So if I'm rolling a die and I get a 5, well, for that roll, x takes on the value of 5. And if I, my next roll is a 3, well, that time x takes on the value of 3. And we might be interested, on average, if we rolled 8 zillion rolls, um, what's x equal on average? Think about that. What should it be? What's the average die roll? Obviously, rolling dice isn't the only way we can generate um, values of x. There are all sorts of probability distributions that'll let us do that. But at least we have our definition now of what a random variable is. And as I said, this chapter is about discrete probability distributions. Well, we need to know what discrete is and how to differentiate that or contrast that with continuous. So a discrete distribution has a finite number of outcomes. If you roll a die, there are only six outcomes. If I'm you know, randomly choosing um, students in a class of 30, you know, one at a time, there's only 30 possible outcomes. Those are discrete distributions. Continuous distributions have an infinite number. For instance, um, I wanna pick a random number between zero and one inclusive. Well, there are an infinite number of those. Um, any continuous curve, like, um, like the normal slash bell-shaped curve, those are continuous. They're an infinite number of possible outcomes. And I know that we're used to seeing PDF as um, a type of file in which we submit our homework during our coronavirus um, instruction. But in statistics, a PDF is a probability distribution function. And we recall back in the early days of distributions, we learned that um, a distribution has a list of all possible outcomes, and we're going to assign a probability to each of those outcomes. So a probability distribution for a rolling die, rolling a die, would be one, one-sixth, two, one-sixth, three, one-sixth, et cetera. That's a probability distribution function. And my note says um, to take a look at page 189. So we look at page 189 here, and we see that Over the next three days, there's a 60% of sun each day and a 40% chance of rain each day. And if we assume that these days are independent, which they're obviously not, because you know if you have rain on day two, that makes it more likely that you'd have rain on day three, because at least there's still, you know, there's been rain in the air. Whereas, you know, if it's been sunny and bright and no rain. Well, unless something blows in on this day, there's not gonna be any rain on this day either. But hey, let's pretend that the days are independent. So here we have um, a probability, we're generating a probability distribution function. We have our um, distribution where sun, sun, sun is 0 0.6 times 0 0.6 times 0 0.6. So there's the probability of having no rain over those days. And you can see that the possible number of days of rain are listed here along with their probabilities. So there's a this chance, a 0.144 chance of having rain on one day, getting it this way. There's a 144 chance getting it this way. 
the one four four chance of getting it this way. So you add those three numbers for the one chance of having rain on one day out of the next three. And here's our probability distribution. There was just that 0.216 chance of having rain no, no, um, none of the days, but there were three chances of having rain um, on one day in the next three. They were independent of each other, so we said, so we added those probabilities. And here's our graph of that probability distribution function. Since we're dealing with probability, obviously the rules of probability still apply. A probability must be a number between zero and one inclusive. That's what that P stands for, probability. It doesn't stand for counts, it stands for probability. And then of course, if you take um, all of the outcomes in your sample space and identify um, and associate a probability with them, you add up all those probabilities, they must equal one or 100%. You can graph probabilities on a relative frequency histogram. Might wanna review what that looks like um, earlier in the book, but let's take a look at page 192. So here are some counts, and there are 150 total um, scores on this test that's um, shown on page 192. So 24 out of 150 is 16%. So a score of two on this test, there were 33, 33 out of 150 is 22%. So again, this is a relative frequency histogram because it has our intervals here. Even though they are um, discrete, you can't get a score of 2.7 on this test. But even though they're discrete, we still have our intervals shown um, by based on the width of our rectangles and we have a relative frequency, or now we're gonna call it a probability, but it's really, if you think about it, the same thing. Here on the vertical axis. So what you're gonna find is that in this section, we're gonna look at things that we did in the past in kind of a new way. For instance, if you go back to chapter two, page 72, you'll recall that we took the mean of a frequency distribution. We took our data points and how many times that data point occurred, added all those up and divided by N to get the mean. If you think about what that's doing, all that's saying is rather than counting each data point one time, so if I have a whole bunch of score on that last test, for instance, that we just, the last screen, uh, last slide we looked at, where you could have scores of one through five, rather than having a bunch of scores of one and adding that um, however many times, it was, instead of adding that one 24 times, we just took one and multiplied it by 24. And then we had a score of two and there were 33 of those, instead of going, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two, plus two. We just took two times 33. So we add, the, all this really does is adds up all the data points and then it divides by the number, or adds up the value of all the data points and divides by the number of data points. That's a mean. If you understand what this is telling you, that clearly makes sense that, oh, that's just the regular formula for average. And on page 72, again, looking at that data that we just looked at, 
we would take one times 24 and two times 33, et cetera, divide it by 150, and we'd get an average of 2.94. That would be kind of the average score on that test on a scale of one to five. Now, if you look at um, page 194, you see the mean of a discrete random variable. And that mean is the sum of x times the probability of x. Well, I want to show you something. What did we say the probability of getting a one was on that test? Let me say, well, there were 24 outcomes out of 115. That's 16%, right? So 24 out of 150. So there's one times 0.16. And we said there were 33 um, twos, and that was 22% uh, of the data. Well, 33 divided by 150 is 0.22 times the two. So you can see if we're just trying to add up a frequency distribution, we can use this formula. If you make it x times f over n, well, f over n is the probability of getting X. It's the probability of getting that data point of X. So this is just another way of writing this, only with the probabilities, because now instead of looking at counts, we're looking at probabilities. We're not saying there were 24 out of 150. We're now saying there's a 16% chance of that occurring. So these are really the same formula. Why do we use X bar here and why do we use mu here? I don't know, maybe that's an FRL. But you'll notice that when we add these up, because again, they're just the same formula written a different way, we get the same answer. So 24 out of 140 uh, out of 150, here are the probabilities. So I asked you a question earlier. What is the expected value, which is an average. What is the expected value of eight zillion dice rolls? In other words, what would be the average in the long run if you rolled the die eight zillion times? To do that, we want to find the expected value. And the expected value is just an average. So here's our formula we just had for average. So the expected value of our random variable x is the sum of the values that X takes on, capital X takes on, and it takes on values of little x, times the probability of getting that value of little x. So it takes on a value of one and a probability of one sixth. It'll take on a value of two with a probability of one sixth, et cetera. Add all those up and you get three and a half which makes sense because one plus six is seven. Um, two plus five is seven. Three plus four is seven. You average those three sevens and you get, <coughs> sorry, you, you take the um, average of seven, or the uh, ah, half of seven because you had two data points each time, three and a half. So in, if you were to um, roll a die eight zillion times and take the average of those rolls, you'd get three and a half. Is it possible to roll a three and a half? No, you can only roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Same as on this problem, where you can only score a one, two, three, four, or five on this test, but the average is 2.94. Also like, um, on my math test, you can only, you know, I don't give half points and third of points and stuff. You can only score um, whole number values from zero to 100 on a test, maybe 110 if I throw in a bonus question. But the average might be, you know, 88.6. So we have variance and standard deev of a random variable.
these are the formulas. I will not expect you to memorize those formulas. I will expect you to know how to use them. So this says take each data point, subtract the mean, square that, and multiply by P of X. Well, remember P of X is, you know, counts divided by um, total number of data points. So this is really just the formula that we used in the past for variance, just written a different way. And then we'll take the square root of that for standard D. So one minus three and a half is negative two and a half. Squared, you get this. Two minus three and a half is negative one and a half. Squared, you get this. Keeping in mind that we're squaring the a negative number or a positive number, like five minus three and a half is this squared. I'm sorry, five minus three and a half is one and a half. There we go. Squared gives us this. Whether our answer is negative or positive, when we square it, these are all going to be positive. Make sure that you push the numbers into the calculator correctly so you don't get negative numbers for this squared quantity. Then the formula says multiply that by the probability. So each of these is going to be multiplied by one sixth and add them up. Well, if you factor the one sixth out, you can add all these up, which is 17.5, and then multiply by the one sixth. So here's our variance. Notice I used an approximately equal to sign. And then for um, Standard D will take the square root of that, which is this value. So rolling a die, even though um, it's a uniform discrete distribution, all the outcomes have the same probability. One sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth. It still has a, a mean of three and a half and a standard D of 1.7. So let me ask this, does this mean that 68% that of our outcomes will fall within 1.7 units of three and a half, rolling a die? And 68% within one standard D, right? If the data are normally distributed, that would be true. As again, again, this data is not normally distributed. This data is uniform. This data does not have a bell curve. It's uniform. So this does not mean, this is still a measure of variation. It's still a, um, a number telling us how spread out the data are. The only catch here is that 68, the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, the empirical rule, does not apply because our data are not normally distributed. So I've already told you that the expected value of a random variable x is x is, is the mean, and that's the sum of x times the probability of x. So let's play Keno. So it turns out that I have a Keno book from the Pepper Mill in Reno. A Keno is a game, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of like the lottery. Let's zoom in here as much as I can. This is a five spot game of Keno. There are 80 numbers and you can pick a one spot, a two spot, a three spot, however many. This is a five spot, so this person shows these five numbers out of 80. And they paid you know, $2 for this game. Let's take a look at what the payout is. So mark five spots. If they get three out of five, they get their money back. Four out of five, five out of five. Hmm. I guess it kind of like the lottery. You know, but only you get to pick however many you want. You'll notice that the payout book one spot, two, three, four, 
and you can mark up to because they in Kino they draw 20 balls um, out of you know numbered one through 80. You can play a 20 spot game, and you'll notice that there's no payout if you get four or five or six out of 20. And the question is, why? You'll notice that you also get only half your money back because it's a five dollar ticket if you get three. Why would they pay nothing for these? And the answer is because these are the most likely outcomes, probability speaking. But hey, you win big money. But that's some difficult calculations. We're gonna we're gonna do the one and the two spot games. So let's take a look at that. So um, write this information down for a one spot. That um, a two dollar ticket, if you get the one number, you get six dollars. So that's a three to one um, probability. There are odds against you. Or, I'm sorry, you get three times your um, bet. And a five dollar ticket, they'll pay sixteen dollars, which is three point two to one. All right. So let's figure out what is, if X is, um, a random variable X is um, your winnings. So what is the expected value of X? In other words, what is the average winnings? If you were to play one spot Kino a lot. Well, you could win four dollars. You say four, it said six, but it cost you two dollars to play. So you're really only winning four dollars. And you're gonna win that one fourth of the time. How do I get that one fourth? Well, there are 20 balls out of 80, and any of those 20 balls could be your one number. So 20 out of 80 is one fourth. There's a one fourth chance that you're going to um, win $4, which means there's a three fourths chance that you're gonna lose because this was only a one spot game to so either win or lose. And you're gonna, you paid $2 to play. So three fourths chance of losing $2. No need to break out the calculator. Get used to and get comfortable with fractions. Four fourths minus six fourths is negative two fourths of a dollar. So on average, you're gonna lose half a dollar or 50 cents every time you play a $2 ticket. Now who plays Keno? The most common people who play Keno, um, if you look at people playing a Keno game is the older people because you can just sit there it's calm, it's relaxing, you just watch the numbers come up. Um, you don't have to do anything except mark your ticket and the old people mark all the grandkids' birthdays, things like that. Um, a lot of people will play Kino in a restaurant in a casino because, um, well, you can't play a slot machine while you're sitting at the table, may as well play some Kino. And they have big screen TVs showing the numbers for each Kino game that come up. But as you can see, you're gonna lose 50 cents or one fourth of your money every time you play a $2 ticket. So you're going to win one fourth of the time. And, but that one time you win, you're only getting three to one. You're only getting three times your bet, not four times. If it was four times your bet, you'd come out even but it's only three times. Even still, here you're doing a little better. You're at 3.2, but you still need four to one to break even. Let's take a look at, well, let's get the data first. Now let's look at a two spot game. Let's write um, this information down for a two spot game. So um, you must win both spots. So that's kind of handy dandy. So you can see that um, 
if you pick both numbers, you're going to get a payoff of 12 to 1 on your bet. And if you do a $5 ticket, ooh, 12.8. But what's the probability? How many do you have to win to make your money back? Give you a clue. It's more than 12 and more than 12.8. So you are going to lose. In fact, playing a two spot game is even worse. So you're going to win $24, but it costs you $2. So you're going to win $22. Where did this 0 0.06 come from? Well, let's see. You have 20 balls on the and the hopper. I'm sorry, you have 80 balls in the hopper. They're drawing 20 of them. What's the probability that your number was both of them? Well, there was a 20 out of 80 chance that your number was the first one. And on the condition that they chose the first one, which they'd have to because you have to win both numbers in order to get this payout. So, um, the probability of the second number also being yours, given that the first one was, is now 19 out of 79. There are 19 balls left that could be yours um, out of 79 total. So multiply um, 20 out of 80 times 19 out of 79, and I rounded here. And then, of course, if you lose, you lose all $2, and there's a 94% chance of that. So now you're going to lose 56 cents. Not 50 cents on a $2 game. You're going to lose 56 cents on a $2 game, which is worse than the $1 game. There is a reason casinos don't often go out of business. And if they do go out of business, it's not because too many people are winning. It's because not enough people are playing there, not enough people are losing enough to keep the casino in business. So there's just a little bit of um, introduction to probability distribution functions. And we looked at some discrete one, a couple of discrete ones, and we'll talk about continuous ones in the next chapter. Um, until then, well, I guess, heck, we have a whole chapter to go before we get to the continuous, so let's look forward to the discrete ones. So, uh, look forward to seeing you in class. Have a great day.